The voice of the knees will come from the cloud. Yeah, <laughs> I get it's all white. You hear this voice. No, are we supposed to? No, that's for those that prefer that. For oh, still okay. doing it up at the altar. Thank you. 
sunshine uh, and it was really nice this past week Elaine and I were visiting uh, our daughter and her family down the Gulf Coast and I don't want to make you feel bad but I will uh, we're down at the beach in this nice little restaurant with an outside deck on the one day and uh, it was 75 degrees and it was the same week when you guys were suffering through the cold temperatures and then we timed it perfectly coming back because when we left Pensacola yesterday, uh, it had dropped into the 30s down there. We got home and it was like 42, 43 degrees. So our timing was just perfect. So I'm completely gloating this morning about the timing of that little trip. So good to be back with you. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, let's get going here. This morning, uh, we're talking about the psalm appointed for today. And where the psalmist says, blessed are those who fear the Lord. And we're looking at this word blessing or blessedness. And how do we have blessedness in our lives? And we're going to be looking at our appointed scripture readings and figuring out with the Lord's word uh, what it means to be blessed, truly blessed. And too often um, in the world. We, we get confused. People in the world get confused about what brings happiness, blessing, fulfillment. And there's an idea that if I can just be totally free to do whatever I want, whenever I want it, that's the ultimate blessedness, to establish my own identity and my own thoughts, come up with my own narrative, and that will lead me to ultimate fulfillment. And what we discover not just from the word of God, but from practical existence, is that when we are rootless in our lives, when we simply look to ourselves to have that anchor to stabilize us or that foundation to stabilize us, or uh, using the idea of travel or motion, if we have no North Star to guide us, no compass to guide us, what winds up happening is we get lost and confused and we suffer all kinds of consequences because we have chosen to be independent of the foundation of Jesus Christ, the anchor of God's word, who God has created us to be as children of God, as his creation. When we abandon God and just try to do our own thing independently, it leads to misery and death. And this is a message that the world rejects but we believers know to be true that when we conform to God that's when we find true freedom and happiness because we are made in God's image we are creatures of the God who made us and that's where our fulfillment comes let's pray Father <clears throat> we come in your presence this morning with Humility and with joy. We begin with this idea of blessed are those who fear the Lord. Lord, we fear you. You are the judge. You are the arbiter of our lives. We are accountable to you because you made us. But Lord, part of this fear of you is this deep respect we have for you. This idea that we worship you because ultimately, Fear leads us to your love. Expressed in Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection and the Holy Spirit that he gives us, that you give us to fill us with your power and grace and life to live. When we discover you 
your will and your grace, then we discover true life and purpose and peace. Lord, thank you for your great love. Help us to be blessed in our lives today and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for opening praise song. I will delight in the law of the Lord. then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unruly. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your own name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, he died from his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. He died from not day, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us heaven and our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was 
pity man, and was crucified also for us under conscious fire. He suffered and buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And when he will come again with glory to judge us both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lord to come. Our point in Psalm for today is Psalm 112. We can read this responsibly together. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commandments. There is no ruling mighty in the land. In the generation of the upright will be blessed. <clears throat> Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in the darkness, light dawns for the upright. For those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will not be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look and triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high and high. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. <clears throat> Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this, is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. From Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read this. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God de destined for our glory before time began. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, the words of Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. 
Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We join together with our message song, Great Hope. share with you a, a, a little video here entitled uh, do college students believe in God it's an interesting kind of man on the street interview process here kind of see where young people are at today and some of the thinking there and then in the context of what our theme is about blessed are those who fear the Lord and uh, join with me in noticing the various responses given to the questions here uh, you want to turn off the lights back there please Thank you, Bob. Yeah, just turn them all off. I'll watch this video. What's up, guys? This is Will Witt with Prayer You. Today, we're at Arizona State University, and we're going to be asking people if they believe in God, if they're happy, and if their lives would be better with religion in it. Let's do it. Are you happy with your life? <laughs> I think that's a hard question to answer. Overall, yes. Okay, good. Uh... Yeah, I guess. Do you believe in God? Uh, probably not. Um, I'm agnostic, so eh? Uh, I mean, I'm open to the idea of God. Do you think that your life would be better with God or religion in it? Um, no, I don't think so. It's hard to say, but I think I'm good right now. Uh, no. Would you consider your life happy? Are you happy with your life? Yeah, I'm totally happy. Do you believe in God? I do believe in God. Do you believe in God? I do. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. Do you think that God makes your life happier, having religion makes you happier? Definitely, I'd say so. Why is that? Uh, God's, if you believe in a God, you're believing in someone to, that directs your life in a way, and I believe God has directed my life to, in a happy way. Um, the more I've fell in love with love himself, the happier I've become. Um, I found more satisfaction in my life. A religion is the best way to access that set of values. Um, that's what makes our country so great. We were built off of Judeo-Christian values. You know, my faith has been one thing that's been more constant than anything else in my life. Do you think if atheists believed in God, they would be happier? Yeah, absolutely. Why do you think that? Well, just because like, both Christians and atheists have to recognize that we're both not perfect, but Christians recognize they have like a redeeming quality that like Christ takes that imperfection and sort of like makes up for it, makes it like 
okay that we're not perfect, whereas the atheists don't have that. I'm a political science major, um, and you know, just looking at the foundations of our country and where our country is now, um, without the Bible, without religion, no country can succeed. Truth bombs, dang. All right, guys, so we just finished up here at Arizona State University, and we're pleasantly surprised at the amount of people who believed in God, uh, were religious, and think that God and religion actually fulfill their lives. It's a wonderful thing. You know, I started out as an atheist, and now I'm a much more religious person. So, guys, if you agree with that message, share this video with your friends and follow me and PragerU on social media. Thanks, guys. I found this very interesting. Let's see, Bob, did you get these ones too? Thank you. Yeah. I, did you see it like I saw it with the interviews of those young people? Do you notice, did you notice as I noticed the difference in the assurance and the confidence level and a sense of purpose, direction, and meaning with the kids who said that they believe in God and those who either did not believe or didn't know. The ones who did not know, the agnostics or the atheists who reject the idea of God or God's uh, rule, I guess you might say, God's place in our lives, did you detect, as I did, the rootlessness there? The lack of, again, what I was talking about at the beginning of the service, the lack of an anchor in life or a foundation in life that stabilizes a person in their life, but also the, the lack of a, a North Star or a compass to direct life. Do you notice the, the difference there between those who uh, believe in God and those who question or deny his existence in their lives. It's plain to me. And it makes sense. If you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to get there. <laughs> uh, if you don't have an engine with the right fuel or the engine itself, how can you motor along in life? If you don't have that compass, you're lost. If you don't have that foundation, everything's unstable and nothing is sure. It's common sense. It really is, and we see it in these interviews here. What are you? Which person are you? I believe, obviously, I think it's a reasonable conclusion, by the fact of your very presence here, that you believe in God and are open to his direction. But we know that according to each one of us in our sin nature, we all have a rebellion against God in our own way. There are certain things we don't want to listen to when God's word speaks to us plainly about something because we prefer doing things our own way, the way we want when we want it. Each one of us struggles with temptation or questions God in our troubles and trials. So we ask the question, where are you at here this morning? And let's bring in the word of God and what God has to say from his word, from our scripture readings. And uh, we begin with... Uh, of course, the psalm that we read, blessed are those who fear the Lord, and I invite you to follow along with the outline of the message here. We begin with this idea that we recognize God's proper place. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, as the psalmist says, which means exactly what it says, that we do fear him, but it doesn't stop there, and that doesn't completely define the message. But it's a good starting point to realize that he is judge and we are accountable to him for what we believe and what we do or fail to do. That we take him seriously, knowing that he made us, we are not our own, 
we are created by him. And then also further, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, his son. So we're accountable both for his law and also for the good news of his son, Jesus, who died for us. And when we, in a sense, take off our hats and bow before him, recognizing these things, that is the fearing of the Lord. Well, number one, this next step here in this journey for this morning with our North Star of God's word, with the compass of God's word. The prophet Isaiah says, blessed are the authentic, the authentic. He doesn't use that word, but I was trying to look for a word that summarizes what Isaiah is saying here. And that's the word I came up with. And it is a, a kind of a popular idea, including in leadership training in the secular business world, that we are authentic as people. It means being true to oneself. I looked at an article when I was thinking about this word authentic, and I found this article uh, online. It was posted by Psychology Today back in 2019. And in the title of the article, it says, what does it mean to be authentic? And the subtitle, what leadership experience and research can teach us about authenticity. And I'm not gonna read the whole article, it's too long for that. Uh, you can find it online, what does it mean to be authentic by psychology today? But I'll, I, I will kind of give you the introduction here. Bill George, the former CEO of Medtronic, often speaks of climbing the corporate ladder early in his career at Honeywell and becoming disillusioned with himself. He mentions wearing cufflinks to try and impress the board of directors. He recalls, one day I'm driving home. It's a beautiful day. I looked in the mirror and I'm miserable. I don't like the businesses I'm in. I'm not passionate about that. But most importantly, I don't like myself. George was acting inauthentically to impress others and had a personal transformation which led him to switch industries and begin acting in a way that felt more congruent with his true self. Notably, in George's retelling of the transformation, it was sparked by looking in a mirror, which presumably heightens one's consciousness of the self. George would eventually move on to Medtronic and write several books about authentic leadership. He would also help develop a course called Authentic Leadership, which is a central course on leadership at Harvard Business School. Now, I think that's a good journey that he was on to realize that he needed to be true to himself and not just do things to impress others or to woo others or to, for uh, money or for fame, but that he had to identify who truly was. So I would, I would agree with that. But the Christian view of authenticity goes deeper than that. And there is a distinction between Christian authentic, authenticity and human authenticity that leaves out the idea of God. Isaiah the prophet, he talks about true authenticity when he's talking about the hypocrisy of the people of Israel and their leaders who would observe outward religious uh, forms or ceremonies or rituals, but really deny the substance of what that would mean. In other words, they would fast on the one hand and, and give this aspect of piety out there to the world, but then at, on the other hand would abuse their workers by not being fair with them, or they would engage in all kinds of conflict and fighting uh, because they wanted their own selfish way and ideas to prevail at the expense of true love the followers of God should have. And they had selfish motives and self-centered thoughts rather than a servant attitude. And here, Isaiah, he also talks about really how God wants us to be truly loving, not just to 
do an outward kind of show, but that we operate and do the right thing with the right motives. And so, for instance, to uphold the cause of justice and right, and to be compassionate for those less fortunate, and to take care of our families and to love our families, these kinds of things. And then there's reward, and it's a God-pleasing thing when we live authentically. And here there's an insight about authenticity that the world doesn't get. And when I say the world doesn't get, I mean those who do not acknowledge God's place in their lives and define everything as self-centered. In other words, I'm the center of the universe. I determine what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what my course is, independent of anybody or anything else. And here there is a difference between human authenticity and godly authenticity that Isaiah is really pointing out. Authenticity for the Christian begins with this idea of, again, as the psalmist says, the fear of God, recognizing we are the creature, not the creator. God creates the narrative for us. We don't create our own narrative. But there's a recognition in that, that there's freedom in that recognition of God's sovereignty and our submission to that. There's not slavery there, there's freedom there. And that actually, if we simply serve our own self-interest, that's a form of slavery. If we are self-centered people, not only are we rootless and have no learn nor star, or foundation in our lives, a compass to guide us, but it's it's a road to destruction for ourselves and for others. Our authenticity needs to begin with the truth that we are created by God in His image, and to find true freedom and fulfillment, we have to discover who we are according to God's creation, created order. I can think of no more compelling illustration of the distinction here than what we see today in this sexual movement where nowadays things are happening that we would not have conceived of having happened even as recently as 10 or 20 years ago, where people now are saying, you know, your birth identity, your birth sex is not what defines you. Uh, in your sexual nature. You choose what that nature is, apart from your biological sex. And this is good and right. It's a finger shoved in the eye of God, saying that God has no right to determine by our natural birth who we are. Now, where does this journey lead? Well, we see the results of this already and the destruction of marriage and family of children even. a child is no more able to determine sexual identity and, and, and choosing to have a surgical procedure done than handling a gun that's loaded a child needs to be trained up in who he or she is according to the creation that God has put in place. Now we recognize as compassionate Christians that we respect everybody and there is there are legal uh, ramifications and we believe in freedom and all of these things uh, according to our system of government. And I'm not talking about dictatorial powers over other people's lives, but let's be clear about what is true and what is good and what is helpful and what is not. And true authenticity begins with this idea of the fear of God, including who he has made us to be, man and woman. And to support this idea, including the idea of family with husband and wife, mother and father, marriage and the right of life of the unborn. We've gone, gone so far astray, God help us in our country, in our culture. And yes, even in our church, we have to be clear about true authenticity. 
We have to determine what this is according to God's rules, not our own. Because there's just destruction if we don't recognize him here. And truly, truly authentic. There's a word, and we used it this morning in, in, in our confession and absolution. And we, uh, we uh, typically, uh, a lot of times we'll talk about affirmation, our affirmation of faith, for instance, with the creeds that we have. But there's this idea of confession, too. The biggest affirmation we can make is our confession. That word literally in the Greek is homologeo. And it's a compound of two words, meaning we agree with the word of God. We agree with God's word. Our confession begins with saying God defines reality. God defines truth. God defines what is. We don't. We agree with God not just man's ideas. Now here's the thing, when we do this, we really discover who we are. Because as part of God's word, this agreeing with God's word, we also recognize what the word of God says, for instance, that each one of us is created in the image of God, but each one of us is gifted uniquely. Talk about snowflakes, how each one is different. Well, God's word says we are all different, too. And we are all gifted, too. We all have talents, too. We all have abilities. We all have resources that are unique and that are valuable. So there is our distinctiveness. There is our freedom. When we follow God's word, we discover who we truly are in our giftedness. We agree with God here, and we discover true authenticity. Number two, the Apostle Paul says, blessed are the wives. Blessed are the wives. Hopefully everybody would want to be wives. And here, just like the word authenticity, there's a distinction between human wisdom and godly wisdom, just as there is between mere human self-centered authenticity and godly authenticity defined by God. The wise person recognizes that God's wisdom is different than mere human wisdom. Paul says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. And what is the essence of Paul's message? And godly wisdom, it is this, he goes on to say. For I resolve, verse 2, for I resolve to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's what we have on the, the cover of the worship folder. Jesus Christ crucified. Jesus Christ not coming to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill them. Recognizing the cross is the centerpiece of all of human history and the the, the, the essence of where we find meaning and purpose and even love in life and hope. It's about the cross. That's God's wisdom. And Paul contrasts this wisdom, this godly wisdom, with the wisdom of what he calls this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Remember the fate of the so-called great leaders of history who are now but dust and a fading memory or people have forgotten about. Even the mightiest of kings eventually goes to the ground as dust, as we all do. The wealthiest go as they come naked into this world and naked leaving the world. The wise person is, is keyed into God and his wisdom and the cross of Christ, because that is the source of forgiveness and life now and forever. Again, we draw the distinction between human and godly wisdom. And finally, number three, Jesus says, blessed are the righteous. In our gospel reading from Matthew, he talks about righteousness. And here he 
rightfully contradicts what the accusation was at the time that he was there to overthrow the law and the prophets, that he was violating the law of God, for instance, when he allowed his disciples to eat with unwashed hands or to eat on the Sabbath. He was accused of blasphemy when he indicated that he was the Son of God. So he's accused of violating the law and the prophets. But we examine these things in the light of God's word and truth and fact. Indeed, Jesus could not com commit blasphemy because he was, in fact, and is, in fact, the Son of God. The only determination we need to make is, is that claim true and based upon, again, the law and the prophets, a reasonable conclusion is that Jesus fulfilled the law that we have all fa failed to keep. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic promises of the Old Testament. If you just read this, just plain, the plain words. Elaine, uh, my wife was just reading this past week in the Old Testament book of Zechariah and how it's pointing so specifically hundreds of years before the fact of Jesus and his ministry and his life. And it's obvious you read Isaiah 52 or 53. We showed video before that of men on the street interviews in Israel, the nation of Israel, and reading from Isaiah 52 and 53. And then the question, who is this talking about? And the person on the street saying, well, it's, it sounds like Jesus. Well, yes. Well, again, there's a contrast here. And there's a clear understanding we need to have. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. They were intended, the law and the prophets, to point to Jesus, not at anything else, especially not just to themselves, but to the one who was to come. What is this righteousness? We Again, as we've seen with authenticity or wisdom, there's a contrast between the human and the godly. There's a contrast between human righteousness and godly righteousness. And first of all, we recognize what the theologians call active righteousness. It means doing the right thing. But we know the truth that so often we haven't done the right thing. We fail to do what we should do and we done the things we should not do. And this idea of righteousness as being merely a human endeavor to earn heaven or to earn our place that falls short of what God requires, which is perfection. We cannot climb a ladder to heaven. God had to come down to us in the person of Jesus. And that's where passive righteousness comes. Righteousness of that kind is what saved. Righteousness of that kind is what gives us love, which shows us that there is love, that God loves us. We love him because he first loved us, and the proof of it is the cross of Jesus. That's where that righteousness really comes from. Well, blessed are those who fear the Lord. Blessed are those who are authentic. Blessed are those who are wise. Blessed are those who are righteous. What about you? How blessed are you? In Jesus, we are truly blessed. We continue the prayers of God's people. Father in heaven, we gather together this morning and we thank you for the blessedness that you give to us. We thank you, Lord, that in our journey of self-discovery, we, we have that when we discover our relationship with you and your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that we have in our hearts that gives us the power to believe and the power to do what you call us to do and to be. Lord, we do delight in your law. We delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray your continued guidance in our lives. Lord, uh, we give you thanks. Uh, this morning, continued prayers about uh, how you are leading this congregation here. We pray you will be done in the future in this exciting time. 
Lord, we pray for our poor hurting world. We pray, Lord, for the uh, troubles that we see in so many different ways in the world. Lord, we pray for your peace, for good leadership in the world. We pray for uh, that you would restrain the hand of evil and support the good in the world. We pray for those who have been victimized by violence or victimized by other circumstances. Lord, uh, we, we pray for uh, Barb and Jerry. We pray for Dottie, Stephen, Greg, Julie, Trish, Mary, Shirley, Nicholas, Jeff, Jean, Joan, Steve, and Mary. Lord, we pray for comfort for the Bill Schaefer uh, family. We pray for the Motel family for comfort and loss of their family pet. Lord, uh, we rejoice in the many blessings that you give to us. Help us to count our blessings, Lord, and be filled with comfort and encouragement by knowing how you take care of us. We do pray, Lord, that you guard, protect, and provide for all of us. And now, Lord, we sum up all our prayers in that perfect prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God forever. We join in our communion song, Jesus, your blood and righteousness. <laughs>
May this true body and true blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep and preserve you steadfast in the true faith. Depart from his peace.
Um, so just a few things. Our mission of the month for this month is the Orland Park Police. A great way to give back to our community is to help out our local law enforcement. Um, they actually even came here on Tuesday to help me. Our alarm went off a couple of times and just to make sure that the building was safe and secure, they came and walked through it before I even came into the building. And then they were here on Wednesday too, morning checking. So um, just a great way to get back to our community is by helping our local law enforcement. So we will be collecting donations for them all month long. Um, the transition team, Pastor Dablinski has received his call papers. We already had one meeting with him and we will have another one tomorrow night um, just to kind of go over any of his questions and concerns and help him out. He will actually be coming on February 19th um, and we will be having a potluck for him. So if you can come, please let us know that you're coming. And then if you can bring anything, there's a sign up sheet to put what you would be bringing. Um, he's working out a possibility of being able to do the sermon if, his, if he can get somebody to fill in for his church. Um, but otherwise, he will definitely still be here for the potluck. Um, we will be having our Easter egg hunt on March 26th. It's a Sunday right after service. And we already have four people signed up for that. So, um, and we've had a lot of families ask about VBS. So we've already put our little blaster out there for VBS. Um, I'm planning a preschool open house in April. That way we can pass out flyers to the families who come for the Easter egg hunt. And um, I do have some garbage in the other room if people can help me bring out, I had to deconstruct the igloo. Um, we're going back to prehistoric times now, so um, if people can help me bring some, I know it's not all going to fit in the dumpster this week, we'll just keep making trips. And then lastly, today is Anita's birthday and Dolores' birthday is tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if we could sing happy birthday to them. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday We are celebrating Kyle's birthday party next Sunday. Unfortunately, that was the only day we could get. But thank you, Bob, for running the tech booth for me. And Bob, do you have anything else to add for transition? Okay. All right. Well, then, see you next. Well, enjoy next Sunday. <laughs>